Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Nancy K. Grace and I hope you will be blessed with encouragement from the heart of God today, discovering diamonds in the dust. You know, it's interesting to me that some of the most intriguing commercials on television bring together the perfect music and the perfect storyline in just 60 seconds. You, and within that 60 seconds, you see a, a man getting ready to propose to a woman. He gets down on one knees and then he presents a little box to her. She opens it up and inside is a diamond ring. There's a proposal and there might be a crowd nearby cheering. What a romantic story this is with beautiful music playing behind it. Diamond ads have a way of bringing together all of these dynamic elements of story. There's romance, there's mystery, and then there's the conclusion, will she say yes? And I think that it's really interesting that Diamond ads are a lot directed at men as their target audience. That's kind of interesting to me because, well, why do men need Diamond ads? I don't think women do, but men might need to have that idea implanted so that they could think of, oh yes, maybe this is the thing I need to get for my sweetheart, a diamond. Diamond ads appear in more men's magazines, like sports magazines, during the holiday seasons. And more diamonds are purchased at Christmas than at any other holiday or occasion during the year. So what is it about diamonds? Diamonds are intriguing. Many girls dream of having one on their left hand one day. So I'm going to say a few sentences and see if you can say the rest of it with me, okay? Diamonds are a girl's best friend. How could we not forget that? And where did we learn that? A diamond is forever. So we have these little sayings about diamonds within our minds that help us uh, intrigue about what they are and hope to have one someday. If you are married, do you remember the day you got that special ring? When Rick and I got engaged, we looked for the perfect ring together. We wanted something unique, like our love. And that day, we searched in several jewelry stores, but could not find what we wanted. We were in the last store before closing, when just the right ring caught our attention. We were thrilled to have found the ring. It was a pear-shaped diamond that was not too small, but was just the right size for me. But you see, we had a problem. We were college students, and college students generally don't have much money, and we didn't have any credit established. The jeweler asked for a character reference. We gave him the name of our campus advisor. After the phone call was made, the jeweler agreed to sell it to us with no down payment or signed contract. All he asked was that Rick return the next week to pay for it, which he did. I was thrilled to have that beautiful diamond on my hand. So as I share today, I'll be sharing about life as a diamond with many different facets. And I hope you can see some facets in your life as I share about mine. As a little girl, I was happy and carefree. I lived in a quiet neighborhood on the south side of a big city. I was most often the youngest in my class, which led me to work harder to prove myself. I had to keep proving myself over and over that I could do things just like the older kids. Well, this played an important part in my becoming an overachiever. I had to continually strive for good grades and strive for that uh, acceptance and for that performance. My family attended church, which became a special place for me. One summer I went to church camp. I loved the atmosphere and all the activities. I especially loved going into the rustic chapel. In the front, on a lighted cross, were the words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Those words intrigued me, and yet I was somehow comforted by their straightforwardness. I found out they were spoken in by Jesus in the Bible, God's word, and I was drawn to them 
and I even learned a little song with those words, which became tucked in my memory. I knew my parents loved me, but I did not hear them say it. My dad was a good provider, and he was fun to be around, but he wasn't around a lot. His free time was occupied with bowling or golf, and often he would come home drunk. This was a part of life for me. As I entered the teenage years, my self-esteem plummeted with t typical teenage girl struggles. My self-worth was being built on what I accomplished. I was caught up now in the performance trap. I expected to get high grades, and if I didn't, I was very critical of myself. Why should I settle for a B when I knew if I tried a little harder, I could get an A? If I could have done that extra credit homework, I could have done better. So I kept condemning myself for even a, an, an acceptable grade, but if it wasn't an A, it wasn't perfect. I studied piano, and I found myself in the shadow of my older brother, who was seriously studying music. I liked to sing, but was never chosen for solos or ensembles. But music remained an important part of my life. This interpreted to me that since I was never chosen uh, to sing or to perform, that I was inferior. My parents did not compare us. I did. And now I was in the comparison trap, thinking any music I played had to be as good or better than anyone else. Now perfectionism was also in full bloom. I could not settle for anything less than perfect. I kept striving, trying to, not to compare myself, but all the time comparing myself to anyone else. During this time, my parents' marriage became increasingly stressed with my dad's abuse of alcohol. The periods of tension at home would rise and fall. We adapted and went on with life. And I remember thinking that even though my parents were not divorced, I came from a broken home. I felt lonely. My high school was so large and I felt so insignificant. Although I got good grades and excelled in many activities, I didn't have anyone to encourage me. These were some of the facets of my life. The sadness and confusion of having an alcoholic father. The brokenness of loneliness. The despair of low self-esteem and the disappointment from not meeting my own high expectations. One weekend, a visiting choir sang at my church. Their anthem had a chanted section with a catchy rhythm. The words said, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old has passed away, and the new has come. The words penetrated my heart. What kind of idea was this? I was even more amazed when I learned this was in the Bible. I thought about it. I did not have to remain lonely with poor self-image. I could put the old self-image aside and come to Christ. I saw my need for a Savior when I learned about sin and the forgiveness of Christ. Sin is what separates us from God, and while I was not caught up in any wild behaviors, I was caught up in negative self-image and self-pity, judging I was not worth anything. That was the barrier between God and me. I thought I was worthless while striving to do my best. The Bible verse from the childhood song came to mind, and that those words were, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Upon realizing God's love for me, and believing Jesus as the way to peace with God, I confessed my sin. I yielded the broken pieces of my life into the loving hands of Jesus. This is what the good news is about. Even though I am a sinner and cannot reach God myself, God sent his Son out of love for me to forgive my sins. By accepting the love shown through Jesus, I am no longer separated from God. The love of God 
has replaced my low self-esteem with acceptance, hope, and strength. I began to see myself as a child of God, precious in his sight. God took the broken pieces of my life and created them into something beautiful. God showed me his wonderful grace through his forgiving love. He forgave my sin and healed my hurt heart. The broken pieces now reflect the love of Christ. I continue to turn to my Heavenly Father, knowing his loving embrace. I have had to reprogram my mind to know that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, a new creation in Christ. I have had to let his love into my heart instead of stubbornly holding on to the lies of low self-esteem. God accepts me as I am, even when I am disappointed with myself. Becoming a Christian does not make life smoother, but it gives strength in the trials, because diamonds are formed under pressure. Faith in Jesus has sustained me through many difficult times. One of those was when I noticed a small sore on my tongue that never completely got better. After several dental visits, I was sent on to see an oral surgeon. He removed the affected tissue from my tongue. Preoperatively, I was told it was an ulcer. He almost did not send it off for a biopsy. In the days following the surgery, when my tongue was healing, I called out to God for comfort and rest. I knew God's presence when I was weak, as I waited for the results. I finally got the call from the doctor. The bad news was that it was cancer. My mind stopped on those words. How can this be? I don't fit a profile for oral cancer. But the good news was that they got it all. That night I sat at my piano and I yielded my questions and fears to God. I played and prayed through my fingers. I could not sing. The amazing thing was that God gave me that deep, special peace. The peace that passes all understanding was deep within me. Faith in Jesus became my comfort and my refuge during the weeks of recovery. I had to retrain my tongue. For a while, my name was Nancy Waif. But this has strengthened me to use my faltering tongue to proclaim the good news and hope of Jesus Christ. When I passed the five-year mark from the cancer diagnosis, I breathed a huge sigh of relief. Into the sixth year, life became one crisis after another. My mother passed away after a lengthy illness. In the way, days waiting for the funeral, I noticed a sore on my tongue once more. I returned home and I immediately got in to see my doctor. He said it looked troublesome and scheduled surgery for the very next day. During that surgery, he sent some of the tissue to the lab for an initial pathology report. It came back clean, but he thought the tissue in my mouth did not look right. He decided to remove a larger section of my tongue to send it off for the complete biopsy. When I left the hospital that day, I did not think it was cancerous. Also the day of the surgery, my mother-in-law had a major stroke. A few days later, she passed away. At my post-operative appointment, I was grateful the doctor removed a larger section because he said it was cancerous. Immediately after that appointment, I went home, had a mini praise concert at my piano, thanking God for the doctor's wisdom. I packed a suitcase and went to another funeral. I was overwhelmed with grief as I recovered from the cancer surgery. Two funerals in as many weeks. God, my Heavenly Father, sustained me with hope, knowing that Jesus Christ defeated death through the resurrection. That was the most stressful and darkest time in my life. Within seven months, we experienced three funerals for my mother, my mother-in-law, 
and my father-in-law. We had the great joy of two weddings as our son married and also our daughter married. And in the middle of this was that second cancer diagnosis. My husband also had a broken leg as well as job uncertainty. God's grace carried me through that challenging season. His grace became a precious diamond to me. I don't know how I could have survived that without the love and grace of Jesus Christ. And now let's get back to my diamond. You see, over the years, my little diamond became more meaningful to me. When I took it to a jeweler for cleaning, I was warned that oh, one of those prongs was wearing thin and could possibly break if I didn't get it replaced. But I did not heed his advice. One day when we were spring cleaning, moving things around in the basement, throwing things out and taking items to the thrift store, we were really busy. But at the end of the day, we took a walk. And at the end of that walk, I took off my knit gloves. I noticed something snagged on my ring. I looked at my hand. <gasps> I realized a broken prong had caught my glove and the diamond was gone. My heart sank. We looked diligently for that diamond over the next months. It was never far from my mind, and any time I saw something shiny on the ground, I thought of that diamond. Well, I was glad that the diamond was replaced for our anniversary that year, but I still kept searching for that original diamond. The words to a praise song echoed in my heart and mind, seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. Well then, about a year later, I was again cleaning in the basement, and I remembered my diamond and the day that I lost it. As I swept, I noticed something shiny on the floor. At a closer look, it was, it was only glitter from an old art project. Oh, I swept a corner, and again I saw a glint of a sparkle, and I bent over to pick it up, and this time... It was only a sequin from a costume. But then, now I'm really thinking about my diamond, but in a moment of divine inspiration, and for the record, I had never done this before, and I have not done it ever since, but in that moment of divine inspiration, I swept under the hot water heater, bringing out a huge wad of dust and dirt. But I looked closer. Something sparkled in the dust. Could it be? Or is it just another sequin or some glitter? I reached down and picked it up. It was hard like a little rock. The stone was dirty, and after rubbing it, I saw it was my diamond. I quickly called my husband to come home. He just had to see this. I met him at the back door. And when I showed it to him, his first comment was, it's so small. Well, then he quickly said we could sell it. Well, why would I need another diamond? But when he saw the look on my face, he realized that was the inappropriate response. He finally suggested it could be remounted into a new setting. And so that is what we did. We had it appraised and put in a new setting. Now the appraiser told me the diamond had a small chip in it. At first, that bothered me. And I thought, after a while, I thought, well, that's, that's okay. Because it reminds me of a really special truth. It reminds me of my search to come to God and how I am given a new heart setting with his love. We come to him with our imperfections, and the master designer reshapes us into new creations reflecting his glory. When we reprogram our minds and hearts to believe what God says about our self-worth, we are his diamonds. We are his treasured possession. We are his jewels. Just everyday women 
experiencing the love of the Savior. God's jewels, his treasured possession. If you don't know Jesus, come to him and put the broken pieces of your life in his loving hands. He will make you into a new creation with a new heart setting. Now when you go to purchase a diamond, do you know that there are four C's to consider? Well, when we come to the Lord, there are four C's also for us to consider. The first C is to come to Christ with the weight of your heart. The carrot identifies the weight of a diamond, and likewise, we can identify our burden of sin and come to Christ for his forgiveness. Jesus Christ is our burden bearer. We can come to Christ with the weight of our sin. The next C is to center your life on Jesus. Let him cut his imprint on your heart. Just as a well-cut diamond will internally reflect light from one mirror-like facet to another and disperse it through the top of the stone, likewise, the brilliance of the Lord will shine through you when you center your life on Jesus, when you seek him more and more every day. The next C is to continue to deepen your spiritual life with the inclusion of prayer, study, and fellowship. Inclusions on, our, on a diamond are natural identifying characteristics, but the inclusion of spiritual disciplines in your life will bring greater clarity to your thinking as you grow as a Christian and as you realize who you, realize who you are in Christ. The last C is to commit to sharing God's radiant love with others. In a diamond, colorless is better. In the life of the believer, the color of, that is reflected is that of purity and the commitment to be God's person in a desperate world. When we extend God's grace to others, we become polished with the love of God. And what is the benefit of extending grace and sparkle to someone else? Your heart is lighter. You keep short accounts and you have peace with those around you. You have peace with God because you are being a channel of his love and you are following Jesus' teaching. Even in difficult situations, God's grace is the lubrication that keeps things flowing smoother. Remember, diamonds are formed under pressure. God is shaping them just as he's shaping you using the pressures and trials of your lives. Accept God's grace to shape you. Over time, the lump of coal becomes a diamond. And over time, you will become shaped into the person God desires you to be, created to be a beautiful jewel for him. So I pray that you'll become more fully the person God desires you to be, that precious diamond. Remember to be God's jewel, just everyday women experiencing the love of the Savior. All you need to do is humbly confess your sin and ask forgiveness to begin the new life in Christ. He will forgive you no matter what you've done, no matter where you have been. Grace is freely given to all. This is God's grace, love and acceptance given to us when we deserve the worst. He accepts us as we are, but loves us too much to leave us there. So as I close today, I want to encourage you, every one of you, to see yourself as God sees you. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are chosen by God before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You are deeply loved. You are totally forgiven. You are God's treasured possession, his jewel, just everyday women experiencing the love of the Savior. God's grace 
is enough for every joy and trial. Right now, I'm facing a health crisis, but I know that my life is in God's hands. I know that God will be with me during the upcoming surgery, and I know that God will still use me to bring glory to Him. God's grace is enough. I will close with Philippians 1.16, which says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Jesus Christ returns. Life is unscripted. Embrace grace and have a blessed day. You have been listening to Living Life Unedited, a feature broadcast of the CWA Radio Network. Nancy K. Grace is an author, pastor's wife, mom, Bible teacher, musician, and friend. You can learn more about Nancy K. Grace, or you can purchase your own copy of Grace Impact by visiting www.nancykgrace.com. Join us back here each week as we continue to grow up grace by learning and leaning on the promises of grace that pulse throughout the scripture.